Good morning, Ohio. James Ernest of the Grueling Truth Radio Network here with Brent Hayden, Olympic athlete and the greatest swimmer in Canadian history. Brent, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So what was life like growing up in Canada? Oh, well, I wish I could say I was, you know, your stereotypical Canadian, um, you know, just playing hockey, drinking maple syrup, and eating donuts, uh, but unfortunately, um, couldn't really be further from the truth. Well, that's maybe the maple syrup part. Um, I'm not a winter athlete uh, at all. I'm a, I'm a terrible skater, um, but, you know, I still was involved in a lot of sports um, growing up, uh, so swimming was just, you know, one of many, and I was terrible at every single one of them. <laughs> um, so other than that, like, I, I don't really know, like, if, if it would really say it would it'd be any different than, um, than any, you know, living down in the States, per se. I mean, I guess it gets a little colder, um, but, yeah, I'm not really a winter guy. So the way I understand it, you are all about the summer sports, uh, like you said, swimming, soccer, baseball. Um, as an outfielder, uh, do you have any good stories that uh, show us your prowess for uh, for baseball? Oh, I, I think you read my bio, so you know exactly what I'm going to say. Um, yeah, like I, like, I was absolutely terrible at it. I was probably the worst kid on the team. So, like, there was this one time, like, I would sit out way into the outfield as far as I could. I'd, like, just sit, up, sit on the grass, just pull on the grass up by the roots, just trying to make a big pile on my pants. That, that was what I was doing in baseball. Um, but this one time, the ball actually um, got hit out towards me. So, you know, I picked it up off the ground, and... I'm watching this guy. He's running around first base towards second. Another guy, running, um, he's past third. He's running towards home. And I didn't know who to throw the ball to. So as I panicked, uh, the coach just screamed, throw the ball home. And I turned around and I threw the ball in the direction of my house over the fence. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, uh, so let's just say, um, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't join the team the next year. So what inspired your love of swimming? You know, it was, um, I, I think what really captivated me with swimming was that, um, you know, if I didn't perform well, it didn't really affect anybody else. Like, I was the only person um, who would be affected by a poor performance. You know, you, you, I mean, with the exception of the relays, um, of course, where, like, um, in those other team sports, um, you know, every time I screwed up, I really felt like I was letting my team down. So in swimming, when I when I screwed up, I was only letting myself down. And so when I and so when I took away those um, those self imposed external pressures of everyone else's expectations, uh, I think I was just able to kind of thrive a bit more uh, in that environment. Now, like I'd already failed swimming lessons, so it wasn't um, it wasn't something that I did just because I was better at it. Because you know, I was again, I said I was terrible at sports, and swimming was just one of those things I was I was terrible at. Um, but I, I just really loved that individual um, aspect of it, and I also have a, a bit of um, like I have, I have an issue with concentration. Like um, my brain actually uh, has too many neurons that fire. Uh, when I'm trying to process uh, information, especially uh, auditory uh, information. So I think there's something with putting my head in the water and just focusing on a black line on the bottom of the pool. It it really um, became meditative uh, for me. It will be able to kind of um, almost like shut the noise of the, of the world off. Oh, wow. And then, of course, going back to what you said there, you had actually had to repeat swimming lessons as a child? Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I failed swimming lessons twice, uh, so I never actually made it all the way through the lessons. So by the time I was um, five years old, uh, I, I have an older sister, and she was already on the team. And yeah, my parents, I think, just decided, like, you know what, maybe lesson isn't the way for Brent to learn how to swim. Now, now I guess you could say, growing up in Canada, like we were, especially in British Columbia, we were surrounded by lakes and rivers everywhere. My parents loved to go camping. Um, you know, so it was really important that, you know, I did get, you know, quote unquote waterproofed. So I think my parents decided, you know what, let's just put him on the team, you know, maybe just getting him into, um, you know, a sport environment would be better for him to learn how to swim rather than, you know, these little, um, teaching classes. And so I, I think that's, I think that was actually, um, one of the reasons why I, you know, it's like, or I should say my parents did succeed or maybe 
at treating swimming like a, like a sport rather than just um, than just the skill. You know, like I, I really did did uh, fall in love with it. So, what of your coaches? Who uh, who taught you truly how to swim? Oh, I, I had a lot of coaches. Um, you know, when I was little, you know, we were just on a, a small summer club team. So, like every single year, we we pretty much have um, a whole handful of, of new coaches uh, coming in. Um, I'd say though, the the first coach that really uh, inspired me to really be the best swimmer that I could be, uh, his name was Phil, and he was there for the last uh, two years of of my time with that uh, with that summer club. And you know, again, like I we had the like the fastest kid in the whole province was on my team, so. Um, I had always been overshadowed um, by him, and so when I think Phil came in, he made me realize that, like, you know, I didn't need to compare myself uh, to other swimmers. I really needed to just focus on my own uh, performance and look at my own uh, victories. And by the end of the season, uh, you know, I became, um, you know, I became the fastest kid uh, on the team. And then by the next year, I won the gold medal at my first um, first provincials. But then, you know, I decided like. It was actually during that last year with Phil that you know I started talking about maybe I wanted to compete at a higher level and join a team that would um, give me or that would train me year round and have the opportunity to go to nationals. So my coach reached out to a uh, coach of the which was the closest club to me that actually did that. There was a forty-five uh, kilometer uh, drive away. Um, sorry, I don't know what that is in miles. But he, he reached out to that, that coach and had him come out to one of the swim meets to, uh, to watch me swim. And so uh, he talked that coach into um, letting me join his club and, uh, and to train me. And within two years with that coach, um, I made it to um, the High Performance Center in Vancouver. Um, got to train with uh, Tom Johnson, who had been coaching every Olympic team since the 70s. And... He's been my coach ever since then, ever since 2001. Wow. That uh, sounds, uh, sounds uh, interesting, just, I mean, all the twists and turns there with it. Um, why, oh, yeah. So at what point, though, did you become soup? <laughs> so uh, the soup thing, that happened uh, shortly after I'm, I went to university um, in Vancouver and joined the varsity team there because... Um, it was it was a tradition for the teams on um, or for swimmers who were on uh, this other team. It was actually the Chilliwack Spartans, uh, my summer club. There were the Mission Marlins. So the two years I did with the with the Spartans, every swimmer once they graduate, if they get onto like a varsity team, it was kind of a tradition to get their um, their team logo uh, tattooed. And it was actually the Superman S. So I got a Superman S tattoo, and after I got to UBC, everybody on the team had a nickname. Um, and people just started calling me uh, Soup for short. And, um, yeah, we just, you know, had a little fun, put a little twist on it. So we spelled it S-O-U-P instead of, uh, you know, S-U-P-E uh, short. So it wasn't really short for Superman because I, I also didn't really um, like it. I didn't like it when people called me Superman because I, I kind of, I don't know, it's, I guess I'm like I'm too humble to want to be, um, like, associated with that per se. And, uh, you know, I thought Soup was a little bit more fitting for my personality. Yeah, I was wondering if Campbell's uh, was involved with the story at all. <laughs> no, that would have been awesome. You, know, you never know. Maybe there's a sponsorship later on down the road. Exactly. There's always a possibility when you come. Ba- now that you're coming back and uh, competing in the Olympics again, maybe uh, maybe they'll have you on a commercial or something. That'd be awesome. Yeah, hopefully, maybe maybe hopefully somebody's listening right now. Who knows? So, how has your training and pe- preparation evolved over the years? Well, so when I first when I first made it to to UBC um, with, at the High Performance Center, like we were training twice a day, um, sometimes uh, six thousand meters a, a workout, sometimes even seven thousand meters uh, a workout, and on top of that, you've got your weight training, your your uh, core uh, training, your massage, uh, your physio, your chiro. All right, uh, so like it's it's pretty much a full time job, and then you know you're trying to do uh, school you know, on top of that. Um, but now, like I'd say, over the course of the you know my ten year international career, those meters were 
were getting less and less. So by the time I was actually training for my third Olympics in London, I was only doing about 3,500 to 4,000 meters um, of practice. So we we're bringing down the, the quantity, but increasing the quality. So I was doing a lot um, more at speed, like at race pace uh, kind of training. And then, you know, of course, I retired after the London Games. You know, I've been retired for seven years and decided to come back uh, last summer um, at the age of 36. Well, I got to train totally differently than, than I did before because at this age, uh, the body uh, body's ability to recover uh, is obviously much slower uh, than it was before. So I'm not doing two practices a day anymore, and now I'm only doing one. And my workouts are, you know, as, as much as 4K, like 4,000 meters on the, like the heaviest days, but on average they're between 3,000 to 3,500. So again, like, putting even more focus on those top end, um, like race pace training and more emphasis on the recovery. And then I'm still doing weights, uh, two to even three times a week. So I've actually picked that up, um, a bit, uh, as well, which I'm actually in the weight room. My body is actually stronger now, uh, than when I was training for London where, where I actually won my medal. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, that says a lot right there that, uh, even stronger now than you were then. Wow. No, oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I, was, I, I think, I think, I think of like during those seven years when I was retired, like I, I really wasn't swimming uh, at all, but I, you know, health and fitness is obviously a very important part of my life, especially like after I retired um, and I wasn't working out um, as often because I didn't have the sport that was regimenting my training routine. Uh, it, it was actually insane how much the, uh, the mind starts to change when you're not getting those daily doses of, of endorphins, um, you know, that working out, getting the blood flow uh, going to your brain. So I realized very quickly that I needed to keep that um, that routine going uh, as much for my physical health as it was for my mental health. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the gym. So, you know, like I said, when I was training before, I was, doing, I was only in the gym, you know, twice a week, and after I retired, no longer swimming, I was in the gym, you know, four or five times a week. So during that time, even though I wasn't training to ever think about coming out of retirement and going for my fourth Olympics, I was just in the gym all the time, and I think I actually ended up conditioning my body to actually be stronger um, than I actually uh, did before. Because on one hand, you could think, like, because of all the swimming, I never actually allowed my body... Uh, the recovery it actually needed to actually get stronger. I was getting faster, but there were, there are a lot of areas in my body um, where it, you know so it was just never able to get to um, you know the strength that it actually could have been at. Oh, wow! So uh, definitely taking some time off. It seems might have been. Uh, oh yeah, and I, I think that's one thing a lot of athletes actually they don't realize they're like they think that they have to train all the time, and if they don't train all the time, then they're not going to get their best, and they. I think that now athletes are starting to realize that that recovery and time off is actually just as important as all the training that you're doing. Oh, definitely. Uh, which one means more to you, the Olympic medal or the world records? <laughs> oh, um, well, I would, I, would, I would definitely put the Olympic medal above the world records, um, but, my, I, but with my world championship medal, my gold medal, um, I, I sometimes bounce back and forth between which one is actually more valuable um, because on a on a personal level, my world championship medal um, means the most because uh, I actually um, had to make a, you know, I saw my grandfather for the last time uh, the night before I left for the world championships and when I was sitting beside his bed, um, like, I, I knew he wasn't going to live uh, until I got home. So I knew this was the last time I was ever going to see him and he woke up and he looked at me and I just said, Grandpa, I'm going to World Champs tomorrow. I'm going to win you a medal. And I wasn't predicted to win a medal. I was a, I was a far outside um, chance uh, to do it. You know, because I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, I was the fastest swimmer in Canada at the time, but, you know, I was going up against, you know, Olympic champions, world champions, you know, world record holders, right? I was going up against, you know, like, like Jason Lezak, you know, who, you know, had like you know, the greatest relay um, anchor of all time. You know, a year later at the Athens or the Beijing Olympics, um, and, you know, and then there was just me, you know, Brent, you know, yeah, I was one in Canada, but I've never actually succeeded. Um, you know, had a notable achievement on an individual basis um, ever in my career. But I think 
because I made that promise to him and my, and my grandfather ended up passing away shortly after, I had a greater reason to succeed um, than any of the other swimmers um, out there on the pool deck. So when I touched the wall and realized that I actually tied for the gold medal, um, it was as much about uh, fulfilling, um, you know, the most like ultimate promise um, you can make as it was about the achievement um, as, there, as as much as it was about the athletic achievement. And then when I won my bronze medal in London, you know, I didn't medal at the, at the two previous Olympics. Yeah you, yeah, you could say that, you know, Athens was my first one. I was a rookie, uh, you know, inexperienced. Um, but Beijing, you know, I was the world champion the year before. I should have gone a medal. And even though I went two tenths faster than what I won my world championship title in, I still only came 12th. And so I didn't even get a spot in the final. Um, and then leading into the London Games, the RC over the last four years, I, I've been dealing with chronic back spasms. Uh, you know, I couldn't go to training camps um, and make it all the way through the camp without um, without hurting my back, spending days out of the pool uh, sometimes. And then just two weeks before those London Games, I had a back spasm at our staging camp, um, you know, in Italy, and I couldn't walk for four days. This is only two, two weeks before the Olympic Games. And so I actually was thinking that, there's actually a chance I might actually not even get to compete at these games. And, you know, what is that going to mean to my story if I'm succeeding at every level of competition, but every time I get to the games, uh, I fail? Like, like, what is, like, how are people going to remember me if that happens? And so I actually almost retired before those games actually happened. Um, you know, I had this conversation uh, with my coach and, you know, let's just let's just say he uh, he he put me back. He put my mind back um, on track, right? Um, and a couple of days after we had that discussion, um, you know, I was back on the water as if nothing had ever happened um, again. So when I walked out onto that pool deck, just realizing how close I had been to not having that opportunity, I knew I had to give it everything I had, no matter how bad my back was just two weeks earlier, no matter the fact that I was the oldest one in the final by five years. Right. And, you know, because Beijing, I had everything going for me and I didn't I didn't succeed. London, I had everything working against me. But because of those failures and those um, those challenges I faced in my life, I think that's why I was prepared to succeed in that moment. Oh, wow. So originally I was going to go with the Michael Jordan comparison earlier. Uh, you know, of course, you know, he uh, got cut from his varsity team, which uh, they exaggerate that story. They make it sound like he was cut completely from basketball and he had a whole year of just, you know, training on his own. Uh, but, you know, you got cut from the swimming lessons and then, uh, you know, ended up becoming a great swimmer. But I think it's more the Kurt Angle comparison where uh, Kurt Angle broke his neck uh, right before the Olympics and you broke your back for the Olympics and still were able to achieve. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it was a broken back. Um, it was like, it was just a back spasm, but like it, I, I couldn't walk, right? Like what would normally be like a five minute walk to the, the dinner uh, hall was like, it took me like half an hour, uh, one day. Like I just, like I couldn't go. Like it was, it was absolutely insane. And here you're trying to think like, I'm supposed to get up on the block and perform like a superhuman. <laughs> like, I, like I, I, I feel like anything but right now. So being considered one of the greatest swimmers, if not the greatest qu swimmer in Canadian history, who else deserves to be on the Mount Rushmore? But not that Canada has Mount Rushmore, but it, the, count, the Mount Rushmore <laughs> of uh, swimming. Oh, man. Like, uh, there are so many, but off the top of my head, um, you know, obviously, like, you know, Victor Davis, who was um, a huge icon for swimming in Canada back in the, the 80s. Um, and I'm trying to remember what, what year he actually um, was killed. Um, but, like, you know, look, everybody looked up to him um, when I was growing up. And then, you know, Mark Tewksbury uh, as well, who was probably, I think, one of the first um, Olympic athletes to really um, come out as gay. And, you know, I, I think he set a really good, um, like, he was like a trailblazer for um, – for athletes being able to, um, you know, accept who they were and uh, and you know and do the things that they love to do, um, and then you know we also had Curtis Myden, who was uh, you know one of our uh, fellow bronze medalists uh, as well. But now, like you know, especially on the women's uh, side right now, um, I mean, uh, other women of course were Marianne Limpert and uh, Joanne Millar, but now we've got you know Penny Alexiak who tied for the gold medal uh, in the hundred free in twenty sixteen. Uh, you know, got Kylie Mass, uh, Taylor Ruck, 
um, Kyla Sanchez, man, like we got so many, uh, so many great um, female swimmers uh, right now. You, you could put any one of them on, you know, the I suppose like you know Canadian swimmers, uh, Mount Rushmore, I think. Nice. So it sounds like uh, they got a really strong team going there. Now, what inspired you to come out of your retirement? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, it was. I, I think part of it has to deal with just how I retired in the first place because I didn't feel like I got to retire on my own terms. I felt like, um, you know, I was I was kind of being pushed um, into retirement, and you know, I'd, I'd say these were probably pretty, um, you know, the the. External, expect, external expectations that I've sort of placed on myself um, again because the year leading up into London you know not even you know just factoring you know the, the back issues I was having but it was also I was also dealing with a lot of um, toxicity um, with people uh, in my life uh, as well and you know these are people that are really really important um, in my life and you know so I was really spiraling towards um, depression uh, that year and I think the only reason why I didn't get there um, you know was because you know, I had you know my amazing uh, my amazing wife who was my fiance at the time um, you know I had a great coach um, and a support system um, around the team so when I did get my medal I, I still didn't really have a solution to anything that was going on and then also like you know I, I figured well, I'm only getting older I, I don't see my back getting better uh so you know maybe I, I just felt like i just needed to kind of take the chance to retire on a high note rather than trying to limp along and just kind of fizzling out uh that's not the way i wanted um to see my career going you know showing up at me and you know getting completely crushed um i i, I just didn't want to i didn't want to do that so so i retired then um but i i always had kind of wished that i had uh, more years left in me uh, but like I said, I think the time away from the pool allowed my body to get stronger in ways that um, I wasn't able to strengthen it before. Uh, a big part of it was like, you know, I didn't have my team massage and, you know, chiro and physio to take care of me anymore. So I really took my time to really strengthen my back so I wouldn't need them. Um, and then last summer, we were, um, my wife is, is originally from Lebanon. Um, we actually got married there in 2012, so we were back there, and we had always had this dream to uh, to put our swim course online. Like we had, we had actually spent a decade developing this swim program, and we had been running it uh, through private lessons. We had been traveling all across Canada, uh, running it with um, with clubs, um, and of course, swimmers of all ages and abilities. And we said, like, you know what? Let's let's put this, um, let's film the whole thing, let's put it online. So even before we left, we were looking around for pools here, but nobody would let you go in with a camera to film. So while we're in Lebanon, I just reached out to um, to this country club that was actually uh, nearby. I, goes, I, I hopped onto Google Maps. I was looking for all these, these little blue rectangles using Google Earth, right? And I found one nearby, and so I reached out to them, and they allowed us to come in, and they actually gave us free memberships for the summer. And it was like the most stunning pool I'd, I'd ever um, swum in. It's called the Jaita Country Club. And we filmed the course there. And while we were filming the course, I started realizing like my body felt really, really good in the water. So I started um, doing my own little workouts uh, before we would film the course. And I started uh, doing short little sprints. And I filmed some video of it. I sent the videos off to one of my friends who's one of the uh, world leading uh, sprint coach just to get his opinion on it. Um, I reached out to um, you know my friend uh, Bruno Fratus, who's one of the fastest swimmers in the world uh, as well. Reached out to Anthony Irvin, who you know um, was an older guy who came back. Uh, after, you know he won the gold medal at the Sydney Olympics, and then he came out of retirement and won the gold medal again in 2016. So if he could do it, you know, he, I'm sure he could give me some good advice. And everybody was like, look at look at me going like, dude, like you've got to do this. Um, so I reached out to Swimming Canada and, um, you know, they were 100% uh, behind me uh, to do it. But I think the big reason though that I was willing to do it was that I didn't actually need to do it um, for, um, you know, to create a better story um, or anything like that. Like 
I, I think it was my body was just um, trying to tell me that it was ready to go and, you know, it was going to give me an, another chance to um, fall in love with the sport again and retire on my own terms. So the uh, swimming uh, videos, now where can people go and see these? How can people learn to swim from you? Oh yeah, so it's online. Uh, so the whole curriculum is online and it's at www.swimmingsecrets.com. Um, so we call it uh, our freestyle mastery program. So what actually really makes it different than other programs uh, that are out there is that it's like it gives you a crystal clear roadmap on how to develop the most efficient freestyle technique, even if you have very little swimming experience. Um, like we've, we actually just got a message uh, from somebody today saying that you know it helped them fix their shoulder pain because a lot of these outdated methods that coaches are still teaching are actually the leading causes of a lot of shoulder injuries in swimmers, like uh, like swimmer shoulder. Um, so that's again, that's one of the re another reason why we're so um, motivated to get it out there because we we just listen to these other coaches and what they're teaching. are like, oh my god, like I can't believe people are still teaching. Like you just watch, like this is just going to ruin people's shoulders. So, um, so we actually developed um, all these drills, like these step by step progressions that are actually going to. Um, it, I, I want to say spoon feed you, but like it it really breaks it down. Like it almost seems like it's almost too simple the way that we did it, and that's exactly what the intention was. So it's um, it's really it's it's been fun. Uh, it was like, and it's been a project that my wife and I actually uh, did together because she was a swimmer uh, as well, and she worked at one of the top uh, private swim schools here in Canada, and actually helped develop their entire upper level curriculum. So it really is like a a marriage um, between uh, high performance freestyle, but learning in um you know in a learn to to swim um, method. The part that amazes me is not the fact that some people can, you know, all, actually everybody can can get, uh, sign up for, what was it, uh, Swimming Secrets? Yeah, SwimmingSecrets.com. SwimmingSecrets.com and learn online. But the part that really amazes yeah. me is there's opportunities out there to actually swim, uh, learn to swim from you in person? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, um, like, everybody that purchases first, like, like they get access to our... Um, you know, we have a private uh, Facebook group that, where I basically hang out and answer everybody's questions. So they, it's not like they just buy the course and then, you know, that's it. Like, they actually, like, I get to actually, like, interact with them and uh, support them um, as well. And, like, I, we were doing the camps um, in person. We've had to put those on hold because I am uh, training for the Olympics again, so it doesn't really work in uh, my schedule. But our, our goal is to take these um, um as like a, an international um, clinic, so we can actually like you know go to like these really cool uh, locations and and run clinics. Like we're already talking to um, people in Spain, uh, Thailand, uh, Crete. Um, sorry, not Spain. I was talking about them in Portugal. Um, right. So really looking forward to um, you know what the future holds uh, for this. So is it true that people can unlock their true potential? Absolutely. Like. Swimming actually isn't that complicated. It, it's just the sum of a lot of uh, very simple things that makes it complicated, All right? So what we did was like, you know, like I said, we broke it down into like the very smallest elements and build it up piece by piece. So you, you don't ever get overwhelmed um, by it. And I think like a lot of coaches, um, especially competitive swimmers, they get stuck um, with a coach that just, they just throw meters at them. They just make them train hard and they don't, take the time to help them develop um, their free speed. Like, we would take these clinics and, um, you know, we'd go in with a club and we'd run these uh, swimmers through clinics just over the course of a weekend. You know, we, we have them count their strokes before the start of the camp. And then we have them count their strokes again at the end. And we almost have a 100% success rate of swimmers swimming the same distance with fewer strokes. So that means that they're swimming uh, more efficiently. So I... And that's without changing their fitness level. All right, so if you just change the way you swim, like, you know, you're going to swim faster. Like, everybody has, has speed that they can unlock with just changing their technique. Oh, wow. So, um, I meant just in, in life in general, is it true that, uh, that it is possible to unlock your true potential? Oh, yeah, no, I, Absolutely. Like, like I, I think I'm definitely um, an example of that. You know, 
kid from a small town who didn't have much talent. Like, I, I think the thing that sets um, real champions apart from everyone else is what they have going on in their heads, right? It's not, I actually think that people who are born um, without the talent, right, not being the best are the ones that actually have the greater chance of success, uh, whether it's in sport or taking those lessons um, into other aspects of their life. Because, you know, when you're not born with a natural gift, you have to, you actually get to learn the values of hard work, and you have like you have to work harder um, to figure those things out. So, I think it actually sets you up for greater um, potential um, later on um, in life. Even if, like I said, if, even if it doesn't involve you in your sport, but like you know, they say when you're standing behind the blocks, like at the Olympic Games, everybody's worked hard to get there. So now the other part is, you know, it's the mental aspect of the game. And if you have the right head on your shoulders, like I said, I wasn't the one that was predicted to win the medal at the world championships, but I had the biggest reason to. What, oh, what is the ISL, the International Swimming League? So International Swimming League is, um, it's a new, um, well, it's a new swim league. Um, it's basically, um, it's taken swimming and turned, and turned it into an actual um, professional sport. So um, it's a huge uh, spectator um, opportunity now for people to go and actually watch swimming. And, you know, it's not just like a radio swimming, like it's a real professional um, entertainment um, sporting event, I guess. Um, so now it's like you've got the world's top swimmers all um, competing against each other where the points don't, or how does this, like, the points that the swimmers earn go towards the actual team, not just towards the swimmer. So, so swimmers are there trying to get points for their teams, and then the top teams at the end of the season, um, they all compete against each other. So you could almost think of it like, um, you know, teams trying to get into the playoffs, right? Oh, wow. So that, so that's something that's never been done, um, and swimming has always been very, um, very individual. So now you could you could be the best swimmer, but if your team doesn't make it, you know, then it doesn't matter. Right? So I, I so, so it's like it's almost like the times don't really matter anymore, right? Like sure, like of, of course, like world records and everything are still super super exciting, but um, but the points that you can earn for your teams are worth more than your individual times. What is your role on the Toronto Titans? <laughs> um, well, nothing's been announced yet, um, but. They're, they've asked me to take on a leadership role, uh, so I'm going to be very, uh, very excited about that because I think I have, de I definitely have experienced that. Um, you know, not just me being in my age, but also have having taken so much time away from the sport. I've, I've gained a different insight that can only be gained uh, from being away uh, for that long. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to the opportunity to, um, to kind of share that insight and that experience with these, uh, these younger swimmers and like we, it's a it's a great roster. I don't know if, if you looked at, but like we got a bunch of like you know Olympic champions and world record holders uh, on there. Um, so it, it's going to be really exciting. Oh wow! Yeah, that does sound exciting. I mean, it sounds like a, a really revolutionary way of uh, watching swimming. Oh, absolutely! Like like when they actually announced it during my retirement, I actually said to my wife, "Like, man, I wish they had that during my time." And like I was. I was actually kind of bitter that, you know, that I had to, like, have swam during my generation because, like, it just seemed like the new generation was just getting more and more exciting. Um, but it's, like, and that's, that's just another thing that I think that's coming out of uh, retirement is, like, it's just giving me that chance to be a part of something um, like this. And, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just feeling so much gratitude um, these days. Now, I've been reading this in uh, different fashion magazines and whatnot, but Astra Athletica, I uh, hear that's one of the big names yeah. uh, going around in, uh, in clothing. Is that, uh, is that true, and what, uh, what is it? Yeah, so um, Astra Athletica is it's an athletic apparel line that my wife and I started. Uh, we, actually, we started conceptualizing it back in uh, 2013, and then we launched it in... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to look at my wife here and see if she nods. I think 2016. <laughs> yeah, so 2016. And I, I wanted to take that concept of rising through challenge um, and turn that into a brand, realizing that, you know, 
challenges are actually preparing you for success later on um, in life. Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think I would have gone my medal in London uh, with everything going wrong if I had not already experienced all the challenges I had faced earlier to prepare me um, for that moment. Now, the, the name actually um, comes from the phrase uh, ad astra per aspera, which means to the stars through challenge. And but it was really built around um, the concept of the three stars. Now, I have the three stars actually tattooed uh, on my torso, and it was something that I actually took from my time when I was, I was doing karate. I actually uh, got my black belt in uh, Ishinri karate, and we had three stars on our crest. And they symbolize the battles between your mind, your body, and your soul. It's not the balance. It's the balance. It's the, it's the battle between them, right? The, the pulling of them. Because a lot of times you're going to have to get them, you're going to have to perform, and you know one of those stars is not going to be in alignment with the others, right? So like when I when I got behind the box in London, you know, my my soul would want to go, um, you know, my mind wanted to go, my heart wanted to go, but my body was not was not a hundred percent, right? So you had to you had to realize like you got to you got to rely on the stars that are going to get you through the challenge, um, and so what I wanted to do it. I wanted to take those stars and. Um, Put, almost like put him into the position of, of a podium, right? So, so when I was coming up with the logo, I was trying to think of something that, that was going to be able to symbolize everything I wanted to say, right? So I took the three stars and put them into the, the three tier shapes of uh, to represent the three positions uh, on the podium. And then I used the A from the word Astra to, um, and put it underneath them to almost like symbolize you being the stars and standing on the top of your mountain. Right, and also like the A could also be like you reaching reaching uh, for your stars um, as well. So the idea is that when people actually wear this clothing, um, that no matter what challenge they're they're facing um, that day, that they get put this on, it almost be like their um, their armor uh, in a way to remind them that whatever challenge that they're facing, it doesn't matter if they actually succeed uh, today or not. But that they're going to learn very valuable lessons that they're going to be able to use later on in life to succeed. And the way I understand it, there are options for men and women. Oh yeah, yeah, no, we, we yeah. So it's, it's men and women. Like I, I designed all the men's stuff, and my wife designed uh, all the women's uh, stuff. We actually just got a message today as well from um, from a client back in my hometown. She said, like, she couldn't believe that we actually, that there was actually a clothing line now uh, from our town that her client actually bought her on the tank top. She said, like, but, um, trying to look at my wife's thing and she nodded, but she was saying, like, um, she had tried, like, like so many tank tops and none of them fit, but finally she finally found one that fit and she was, like, was blown away by the quality. And I think that's one thing that, um, especially me being, um, being Olympian, like, I'm absolutely obsessed with, uh, with quality, uh, controls. I didn't want to just, print logos on t-shirts and just sell them like, like we went over like every aspect of every single uh, garment uh, from the material that we're selecting uh, to the stitching uh, that we use to make sure that the threads stretch right? um, and just you know fitting you know everybody's body types you know all, all that stuff um, it, was, it was a big learning curve <laughs> for sure especially for um, you know somebody who doesn't have a history um, in apparel but you know we were very proud of of what we're able to um, to come up with. So, what other things, uh, what other projects and ad adventures do you have going on? I mean, not that that's not enough, because you clearly got a bunch of uh, stuff with coming back from the Olympics and and your, you know, the uh, ISL and uh, the clothing line and the camps. But uh, any other things that we need to cover? Well, I, I've always been um, been um, a serious photographer. Um, it was something that, you know, I loved to do uh, when I was a kid um, in high school. I, I did two years of photography classes. And this is still, this is before digital, right? So if you realize that, you know, I'm coming out of retirement, you know, I was in grade 11, grade 12 before there were digital cameras. So I've been around for a while. Um, and I was actually featured um, by Hasselblad um, last year. So like, that was a huge um um, a huge, like, honorable uh, mention that I got from them to actually be recognized by one of the most prestigious uh, camera brands uh, in the world. And I've actually had um, a number of uh, solo um, art exhibitions um, as well, uh, mostly in Canada, but I had one uh, down in the States um, as well um, at the 
like a Sarah Arch Premier's down in uh, La Corner, um, Washington. So it's it's nothing that I ever really um, pursued to be considered, um, you know, an artist per se. It's just uh, photography has always just kind of been my my outlet, especially from swimming. Um, it was kind of my balance, like because you know whenever I'm training really hard or you know I'm getting really um, stressed out. Um, you know, I, I could just kind of go and take my camera and go to, um, go walk the shoreline somewhere and, you know, kind of lose myself in, uh, in the viewfinder and, um, almost kind of like find myself, uh, in a way. And I, I try to capture that feeling in my images. So most of my images are very, uh, very minimal. Um, most of them, um, involve water, um, as well. And I've, I've come, one way I could describe it is, um, there's like there's like kind of a moment between when you're when you get up onto the starting block then the crowd goes silent before the gun fires you know and and you feel your heart pounding in your ribcage that's kind of the moment that i think i actually do try to capture um in my images and now i've actually i've, I've gone back out of digital i'm actually um what's the word de-evolutionizing <laughs> or going i think i just made up a word um, I'm going back um, fully into film, so I'm actually building a dark room out at my my parents um, in my parents' basement right now, so I can actually just um, get back into it. So from the film to the finished product, like there's actually going to be a um, a piece of me in every single step of the way. Oh, wow. right, so when you're actually holding the image, like that's one thing that you don't you lose in digital because you can just put it on a computer and you just throw on a bunch of filters and make it Facebook kind of cool. Which, I mean, not dissing that at all. I, I, it definitely has its place, and you can definitely come up with some beautiful images that way. But there's something more tangible about shooting film and having your hand in the process all the way until the finished, um, developed um, image on the photo paper. Yeah, I really like your um, your shooting where um, it was the black and whites, and it it's got the water and the rocks. Kind of looks like mm-hmm. you're on like an island almost. Oh, okay. Is um, that the one with the ladders? Yes. Yeah, I think that that one has been one of my most popular images. Um, that that one was digital. That was right before I made the switch back over. Um, that was taken in, I think, 2017 um, in Beirut. So those were sea ladders along the corniche that um, swimmers there can, you know, they they dive off the rocks and they go swimming, they go spear fishing there and they use these ladders, you know, to climb back up. But, um, some, some, there's one, one of those images actually after I, after I took it and I looked in the, um, in the review screen and I actually started to cry, um, because I was, because you look, see the ladder and it actually reminded me of a ladder at the edge of the pool. Um, and it, it took me back to the moment when I climbed out of the pool at the Olympic Games for what I believed was going to be my last time. Wow. I mean, yeah, just just phenomenal. I mean, it sounds like uh, you have a lot of things uh, exciting going on. Uh, before we let you go, where on social media, where on the web, where can we buy Austria Athletic clothes? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so Astra Athletica, um, you just go to astraathletica.com, that's A-S-T-R-A, then athletica, um, dot com. Uh, we're at, at Astra Athletica on all the social media channels. Uh, Swimming Secrets is um, at Swimming Secrets Mastery um, everywhere um, as well. And you can find us on, on Facebook. And then my personal um, social media everywhere is the Brent Hayden, so T-H-E, Brent Hayden. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, like we're, we're everywhere. <laughs> that sounds great. And uh, definitely, uh, ho- hopefully between now and uh, the Olympics next year, uh, we'll be able to follow up with you. And, uh, you know, we wish you the best. Oh, thank you so much. This was really a pleasure. It has been a real pleasure. pleasure. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, we've enjoyed having you on the show. And, uh, yeah, definitely we will uh, get uh, send you the link so you can share it with your uh, your fans. Oh, thank you so much.